And uh, just a reminder that uh, there will be a session tonight, so after the last speaker, uh, before dinner or after dinner, but sometime before 7, um, you can go ahead and start putting the posters up on the poster board. So. Hi, I'm going to have a chance to say hello to most of you because I just got in around lunchtime, but I'm very excited to be here for the rest of the weekend. And when given the task of doing the talk on quantum optics, um, I thought, well, we'll see what we can cover in half an hour. and We'll see what we can get to. I probably have way too much stuff in here, and your task is to make sure that I don't get to the end of it. I will be asking you for help and thoughts at various times, so you should also jump in and interrupt me, slow us down as much as possible. We'll see what happens. Otherwise, I think this might be kind of like the bus tour, where you say, oh, there's the Eiffel Tower. Oh, there it was. So let's see, let's see what we can do. <coughs> okay. um, the, the one unifying theme here is that we're going to talk about things that are important because light comes in photons. And I want to talk about kind of two main consequences of that. One, a set of complications that occur when you're trying to do experiments that might be inherently classical style experiments where you have an oscillating electric field and you'd like to measure something about the way it oscillates, maybe in an interferometer, or maybe interacting with matter, something like that. And what you have to think about more carefully because light is quantized and obeys the rules of quantum mechanics. And then secondly, a set of opportunities that come along with the fact that light comes in photons and photons are quantum mechanical particles with degrees of freedom that are described by quantum mechanics and what we might be able to do exploiting that for, for instance, quantum information. Okay. So light comes in discrete quantities. Packets, so light of a given frequency comes in. Packets that are indivisible of a certain amount of energy. That's the main message. Here's just an illustration of a photograph of something taken at varying light levels. This was on real film because it was 1953. So it's a little bit debatable what this shows the granularity of, whether it's light or film or what. But maybe just a conceptual illustration that this object was exposed with very low levels of light. And what showed up when the film was developed was this not some really dim, dark, gray, smooth thing. Okay. Expose a little bit more, a little bit more light, a little bit more light, and a little bit more light. So what we're talking about is something that on a daily macroscopic scale looks really smooth. You don't necessarily see that there's any granularity to any of this stuff. But if you use small enough amounts of light, you begin to see that something comes in chunks. Right. Here's another illustration, slightly more technical, of that. So when I'm imagining that most of you have studied this, and what, what sort of evidence is presented in the classes you've taken that light is quantized? Not this one. Yeah. The photoelectric effect, okay. Historically, that was a big clue. Anything else? The Compton effect, okay. Yeah, those are a couple that were early, really, really major signposts along the way trying to convince people who were at the time very reluctant to accept the idea that light might be quantized. The example that I want to talk about briefly here is a little bit different, something that was hard to do couldn't have been done then and also sort of relies on a conceptual feeling already that light is quantized before you can even start to do this experiment. So maybe you can check that light is quantized by arranging to have one photon go onto a beam splitter and set up detectors to measure reflection and transmission. And conceptually this experiment is very simple. If photons are allowed to split into two, or into more than two, or into an infinitely divisible set of things, then you should be able to get some light over here and over here at the same time, no matter how you deliver little tiny amounts of light energy over here. But if light comes in individual photons that can't split up, then you should only be, if you send one photon at a time over here, you should only get something here or here and not both at the same time. So this is an experiment that many people can now do in their laboratories and many people actually can do in undergraduate teaching laboratories and I think there are many people here in the audience who have a setup like this at home, so to speak. 
but here's the setup that we use in our junior optics lab at Harvey Mudd. There's a pump laser that pumps a pair of spontaneous down conversion crystals. And all of this is designed to get a single photon at a time to go onto a beam splitter here. Not really a single photon at a time though. It's difficult to build a machine where you press a button whenever you want one photon and the one photon comes out. So instead this experiment cheats in the following way as many experiments do. It involves something that once in a while produces a pair of photons at 810 nanometers in this case, but of a frequency that you're all set up to go and look for. Um, and the mechanism that produces them produces two at a time so that you can use one, which is traditionally called the idler, just to gate the real experiment. You can use one just to tell you, hey, there's a photon over here because there's a photon over here. And in that case, you can get what's called heralded single photons over here. And you can do your measurement and determine that if you're sending one photon at a time over here, because you're, sending, you're making one pair and then a little while later, you're making another pair and another pair, that you can measure, we can measure, other people can do much better, but we measure routinely in the junior optics laboratory at Harvey Mudd. For instance, 500 coincidences per second between this detector and this detector and about 500 a second between this one and this one. So when there's a photon over here, there's a photon somewhere over here and it goes here or it goes here. And if you measure when there's a photon over here, how often does light go both ways at the same time? Zero or as close to zero as an experimentalist would be happy to accept. That is a small rate, like less than half a second on average, that can be explained by other sources of noise that we know about and can calibrate in the system. There's just some details that I'm going to skip about spontaneous parametric down conversion. What I want to talk about first is if light comes in these quantized chunks, we call them photons, they carry a certain amount of energy of the electromagnetic field of a certain frequency. What's complicating about that? From the point of view of kind of a classical view of, say, a traveling electromagnetic wave. So here's a traveling electromagnetic wave moving this way, I might come along and say, I'm going to sit in that plane right there and sample the X component of the electric field as a function of time. So I should expect to see it right now at zero. If I just sit here and sample, I should expect to see some large positive values and then down and negative and maybe something like this. Right. What else does that curve look like? A sine curve. Mm -hmm. If I drew something like this and said, label the axes something that happens a lot in physics. Sorry? X and T, so X and T in what? So you're saying, let me, instead, of, instead of that being the electric field in a traveling e m wave as a plane wave as a function of time, you're saying let this be like x as a function of t? In what kind of situation? Spring displacement. Spring displacement, so mass on the spring. spring. Yeah, okay. Right. It's the same function of time, so somewhere underneath it must be the same differential equation. When we move over to quantum mechanics, it's all about solving the differential equations in a quantum mechanically correct way. So, Quantum mechanically, we call this what? The mass on a spring is an example of what? Okay, a harmonic oscillator, and if we turn it into quantum mechanics, then in quantum mechanics you can solve the problem of the quantized harmonic oscillator. The quantized harmonic oscillator, you have something in a potential well like this. Potential well has some spring constant to it. The object has some inertia or mass. Maybe it's not a mechanical harmonic oscillator, but I'm thinking about a mechanical one. And what do you learn in quantum mechanics about the harmonic oscillator? We're getting some wave functions over there. Okay. <laughs> 
Um, what are the wave functions that you would be interested in having me draw? <laughs> The ground state, okay. So we learn that the energy is quantized and there's some minimum energy. It's not zero. If that's zero, the minimum definite energy that can exist is this one over here. How much is it? One half h bar omega omega is the angular frequency of the oscillator. Okay, so the ground state has a wave function psi of x looking something like that. Oh, that's really awful. Well, I won't be able to draw a better Gaussian, but maybe I can make it a bit narrower. All right, Ugh, that was a worse Gaussian. Okay. Um, what if I have something? So that is the wave function of the ground state. at some time, like t equals zero. Um, what if I wanted t greater than zero? What should I do to this? What does the movie look like? Is it your question? <laughs> Assuming that I drew the actual ground state wave function, which I will, I will give you that I did not. Right, but, but if this were the real ground state wave function, how do you play the movie forwards from here? Isn't there, it's a stationary state. Isn't there not a movie? Yes, the movie is extraordinarily boring. This is psi of x and t. Right? That's what I was fishing for, that we learn in quantum mechanics that the energy, so first we've learned that there's an energy, a minimum energy, and it's not zero. And Second, we've learned that something that has a definite energy has a wave function that doesn't change in time, or at least doesn't change in time in any significant way. Um, the overall phase will change, but the shape of it won't change, and certainly its modulus squared won't change, so none of the probabilities for the particle to be anywhere will change. So that's what we've learned from the quantized harmonic oscillator in a mechanical world. You probably haven't, or many of you probably haven't, studied it in terms of optics. But I'm now making a hokey argument that any time you get a sinusoidal function, the same differential equation is obeyed somewhere in the back end of the physics. And indeed, if you work with the equations that govern the electromagnetic field, you can make a lovely mathematical equivalence between them and the harmonic oscillator equations. And then you can quantize the electromagnetic field exactly the same way. And what you learn are some very similar things. So a photon, remember, is a state of the electromagnetic field with a definite amount of energy. So first of all, a state with a definite amount of energy is a stationary state. Probabilities don't change with time in a stationary state. So if you were to take a one photon state and you were to plot that electric field in the x direction as a function of time as that thing went past you, it would not wiggle, or at least on average, it would not wiggle. If you were to sample it over and over again, if you were to make the same one photon state, send it past, sample it, oh, that doesn't look much like an oscillating electromagnetic field. So a state that is a state of one photon is not a particularly nice state to go and wiggle something with or to put into an interferometer and measure something with. We also learned that there was a minimum energy and it wasn't zero. So if we put a zero photon state, that's often called the vacuum. The same thing happens in, in, the, elect in the case of the electromagnetic field. You don't flatline the electric field as a function of time at zero. You get a non-zero variation around zero. There's some minimum energy and it's not zero. Professor Jones was talking about spontaneous emission. This is why spontaneous emission. In other words, that those hydrogen atom eigenfunctions are eigenstates of the Hamiltonian for the electron and the proton coupled to each other. They're not going anywhere unless some other perturbation comes in and shakes them. The perturbation that comes in and shakes them that causes spontaneous emission is the interaction of the electron and the proton with these fluctuations in empty space of the electric field when there are no photons originally present. 
there's some stuff we learned by analogy with the harmonic oscillator. It would be nice to still think about doing experiments where there's an oscillating electric field and you measure something like interferometry, for instance. And so a question that occurs to me is what kind of quantum states actually do behave like something that oscillates back and forth? And that's a question we can explore in the case of the harmonic oscillator as well. Um, maybe over here. Has anybody studied this? How do you get a quantum mechanical state in a quantized harmonic oscillator potential that actually kind of keeps its shape like a well-confined little ball and moves back and forth? Maybe nobody has. That's OK. They're called coherent states. Nope. So I will tell you by fiat that what you can do is take that ground state wave function, exactly the same size and shape as the ground state wave function, and you can either give the whole thing an initial momentum that's not zero, or you can displace the whole thing from the center, depending on how you want to start your initial conditions at t equals zero. You can just take that ground state wave function and either translate it over or kick it a little bit. And it will give you something that keeps its shape and just oscillates back and forth. So I can make a little bit of a hokey argument for that by saying, uh, let's say, that I put a little Gaussian-shaped wave function up here. It wants to spread in quantum mechanics. So I should be worried that it's going to do this. But here, where it's on the way down, the back part is experiencing a higher slope than the front part. So it wants to spread, but because the back part is accelerating downwards faster than the front part, it also wants to recongeal. And those two effects in this size and shape of Gaussian wave function exactly, exactly balance each other in a beautiful way. That part I can't show you right now. But you can do this. And you can do this to write down a mathematical state for a coherent state of light as well, in which, well, if you don't have a very large amplitude of light, it looks like that. In other words, it doesn't matter how far you kick it, the width of the Gaussian, the width of the wave packet is the same. So the amount of noise is kind of the same. If you make it bigger, the amount of the noise is kind of the same. But now it doesn't look so important on the scale of the overall oscillation. And if you give it a much larger amplitude, the overall scale of the noise is still the same. I tried to do this on a roughly self-consistent scale. But if you zoomed out of it so that you could see the whole function, you'd begin to get something that looked like, oh, this is the kind of classical light that I'm used to looking at over and over again that just oscillates and doesn't show this extreme fuzziness. Nevertheless, because light is quantized, if you dial down the amount of light, even if you do it in the most classical possible way, so to speak, in these coherent states, eventually the fuzziness that comes from the fundamentals of quantum mechanics begins to be really, really important on the scale of the overall amplitude of the light. Let's say you were trying to do a sensitive interferometry experiment with that. So you want to sit right here where the electric field is zero and measure small changes in position of a mirror by small changes in the electric field amplitude. Ugh. That does not sound encouraging. Yeah, no, not a good idea, huh? So what if you played a game like this? Here's our coherent state. Here's where we'd like to sit right here. So you can make states of light that are called squeezed. They throw the uncertainty into different things about the light. So you can make something like that. You can sacrifice a whole lot over here to get really nice precision right here where you might be interested in. Or you can sacrifice in the other direction. <laughs> or you can take that vacuum, which seems like, OK, the vacuum, it's not a big deal. Let's say you make an interferometer, and the first thing you do in an interferometer is you take an incoming beam of light, and you split it two ways at a beam splitter. That seems like an innocent thing to do. But what did you put in over here on this input port of the beam splitter? 
In this diagram, what have you put in coming up from the bottom? Nothing? But there's no such thing as nothing. This is the vacuum, which is the closest you can come to nothing, and it's got this noisiness built into it right here. So just by doing this, you're going to insert some extra noisiness into an interferometer that you go on to make from these things. You might be able to do something about that, too. You might be able to take the vacuum state and squeeze it so that its noise is concentrated in certain areas and less concentrated in others. So there are numerous people in this room who know a lot more about that than I do. But I wanted to try to mention it and talk about it as kind of the first piece. The second piece is going to have to go pretty quickly. I think I have almost 10 more minutes. Yeah, okay. Um, the second piece turns to, okay, can we embrace, well, this in a way is embracing the quantum mechanical properties of light to help us understand where fundamental noise is coming from and try to make it smaller. Let's further embrace quantum mechanical properties of light and think about using photons as quanta as quantum mechanical particles that are extraordinarily easy to transport. Maybe not extraordinarily easy to store, but extraordinarily easy to transport. And so the quantum mechanical properties of light are often exploited in quantum cryptography schemes, in communication schemes. Why? Well, this is somewhat sensationalist popular press. I don't know. I find it somewhat sensationalist, this popular press book. It's not very new. Um, this is a quote from the code book. It says, a quantum computer would jeopardize the stability of the world. Which might be true. <laughs> um, maybe not in a geological sense. I don't know. Um, but that people come back. So in other words, he's referring to the idea that a quantum computer would break our current encryption standards if it were sufficiently fast and working properly. Um, in response to which, maybe we need a new type of encryption. And various business websites actually do like to talk about this. So maybe you follow this already, but maybe not. Here's a business website. It's probably from about two years ago. It says, race against time, securing our future data with quantum encryption. Your data are encrypted, but when somebody builds a quantum computer, they won't be, so you better invest in quantum cryptography now if you don't want people to read all of your encrypted stuff in 20 years, is what this business website is saying to its readers. As people work on this stuff, real companies, major governments. Um, here's one way that we can, here's one system in which you can do some quantum encoding of information and sending it along to people. Polarization of light which is a nice, again, classical property, but which we can also think of as a spin state of individual photons, or the polarization state of individual photons. So here's light. It's traveling out at us. We're going to talk about horizontal and a vertical polarization that we're going to denote like this. Some of you might not yet have taken a quantum mechanics course in which quantum mechanical states are written in this type of notation. How many have not taken a quantum mechanics course like this? Yeah, OK. You'll get there. It's the most fun thing. OK. <laughs> so this is called Dirac notation. Short, 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 short. Look, these funny little brackets, this funny little thing is called a ket. What goes inside is the label for what state the thing is in. So this is a photon in a horizontal polarization state, a photon in a vertical polarization state. Polarization, just like any quantum thing, you can have superpositions of it. So here are two interesting superpositions, one I want to call 45 degree diagonal. And the other I want to call 45 degree anti-diagonal. This is a lovely geometric example of a simple quantum system because you can really see geometrically indeed what these plus and minus signs are doing to create really different states. Complex numbers, as we know, are allowed in quantum mechanics. Here's right circular and left circular polarization. We can measure quantum states. We can measure these quantum states in, let's say, the following way. If we want to measure in the horizontal vertical basis, let's just use a polarizing beam splitter that's really good at transmitting only horizontal, reflecting only vertical. If we want to measure something else, let's just use that polarizing beam splitter again, for instance, but let's use a half wave plate in front. What the half wave plate does, if you're not used to thinking about them all the time, is it mirror images every incoming polarization around the special axis that's marked on the half wave plate. And so 
you can use that feature to turn any set of two orthogonal polarizations into horizontal and vertical so that effectively this whole setup right here ends up transmitting one of your polarizations and reflecting the orthogonal one. So you can change basis like that. And you can use a quarter wave plate if you're interested in measuring in an arbitrary basis that maybe has some eyes in it. Okay. You can get entangled states of these polarizations. So you can write down, if you have two photons, called the signal and the idler, for instance, just as we did before, we can write down states of the signal and the idler. So here are four of them. But we know there can be superpositions. So here's a superposition. The superposition is kind of innocuous. It's the signal is horizontally polarized and the idler is horizontally polarized, or the signal is horizontally polarized and the idler is vertically polarized with the following distribution of probability amplitudes and sign in between those two terms. But what's, what's innocuous about this, though? What's, what makes this really innocent and not a terribly disturbing quantum mechanical state? The square of that. Oh, so are you saying it's properly normalized? Like if I were to say, what's the probability of finding, say, any of these four options, and I would go through, and the probability of this would be one half in this state, and the probability of this would be one half, and these two would be zero, and we'd add up to something sensible. I think I know what you're saying, and, and you're right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know the state of the signal, for example, but you don't know the state of the um, Okay, so, so you're saying we know the state of the signal, for example. I'd love to pursue that a little bit more. What are you noticing? Uh, they are not that, that the only state for the signal that shows up in this is H? So I think you're suggesting that I could rewrite it like this. I could factor out the state of the signal photon. It's written like it's something kind of complicated, but actually, for sure, in that particular state, the signal photon is horizontally polarized. And then once I factored it out, what does this tell me? Whoops, that belongs out here. What does that tell me about the idler photon? I need another parenthesis. It's a super, particular superposition of horizontal and vertical. Is this an undefined polarization? It's just 45 degree diagonal, yeah. This is a different state, but it's not inherently, I think, a much more interesting state than the ones up above. It's just written in a basis that makes it look a little complicated. That state, though, that state is special. Right. You can't factor it. I can't factor it, you can't factor it. It doesn't factor out. This state, unlike this one, does not have a description in terms of the signal photon is this polarization and the idler photon separately is this. This is an entangled state in which the individual particles, the two photons, don't have definite properties at all in any way whatsoever. All they have is the nature of the correlation they share with one another. So here's a little hint of how that might be. Right. I wrote this down because I had shown with the geometry on a previous slide that 1 over root 2 h plus v equals d. If you, take, if you haven't done this before, I urge you to do it. Everybody should do it at least 10 times in their lives. Right. You should take this entangled state. You should substitute into it. Every time there's an h, you should substitute in the way that horizontally polarized state expands out in the diagonal, anti-diagonal basis. And every time there's a V, you should write in what that looks like in the diagonal, anti-diagonal basis. You should multiply everything out, collect and cancel terms, and get that. So this state looks to me visually the first time I look at it like, okay, no biggie. These two photons, either they're both horizontal or they're both vertical. We just don't happen to know which for a given time that we measure. But that's not even a particularly nice description because if I asked about it in this basis as well, no, now it looks, this exactly equivalent state looks now like, oh, either they're both diagonal or they're both anti-diagonal. And I could write it in any other basis and it would show an equal degree of correlation 
or maybe of anti-correlation if you started writing it in circular polarization bases. So this is called an entangled pair. Here are three other mutually orthogonal to the first that are also perfectly entangled. This is called the Bell basis for a pair of two-state particles. And in all of these states, they share this nice property that any individual particle has no definite state. So if you take any single particle, any measurement you do on a single particle from this pair, totally random, you will gain no information from that. All the information is in the way that they are related or the way that they are correlated to one another. I'm going to skip over a bunch of stuff real quick because what I want to end with is to show you a particular quantum communication <coughs> protocol that might make use of those properties. Okay, that's not what I wanted to do. Hello? Here. There we go. Okay. It's called quantum dense coding, just to give you an idea of what this might be useful for. So here's Alice and Bob. Alice lives in Arizona, and so does Bob, but Bob is moving away. I just had this realization that states don't start with B. Where is Bob moving? Baltimore. Boise? Baltimore. Baltimore is ba Baltimore's further away. All right. Bob is moving to Baltimore, and they, hang, they spend their last night together in an apartment making entangled pairs <laughs> of photons. <laughs> right? So they make a whole bunch of pairs in states like this, and because they want to communicate with each other secretly, and there's this person, Eve, who's kind of been stalking Bob, and they don't want their correspondence in the future to be overheard by Eve, but here they are. They make a whole bunch of pairs like this, and Alice keeps the signal, and Bob takes the idler, packs them all in his suitcase, or his tool belt, as the case might be. All right, puts them all in his tool belt, and he goes to Boston. No, Baltimore. Sorry. He goes to Baltimore. And there he is. And now they have this great way of communicating with each other very securely because here's the scheme. Um, Alice can only say four different things to Bob. So they agree. I, I asked my research group, and these are the messages they came up with. So this was like I don't know, a year ago or something. <laughs> um, you know, said if Alice can only say four things to Bob, like here they are. I love you. I miss you. The pack. I don't even get this one. <laughs> and it's over. All right. So every time Alice wants to send one of these four messages to Bob, what she does is she takes her particle that she kept. She used, they use up one pair every time they want to send a message. Alice takes her particle, and if she does nothing to it, then she sends it to Bob, and Bob now has in his possession a state that looks like the original state. Right? If she wants to send this message, she switches horizontal and vertical. Oh gosh, this should say S. Ha. That would be really. All right, these should all say S. Where is this? I don't know. Um, they should all say S. I got very clever. Changing subscripts, and I changed them wrong. Um, so the name of the game here is that Alice is going to send a message to Bob by sending, by changing the state of her particle alone and then sending it along to Bob. So if she doesn't change anything, she sends her particle to Bob, Bob will have this. If she changes, if she swaps horizontal and vertical for her particle, so she puts it through a half wave plate, oriented at 45 degrees, let's say, she sends it to Bob, then Bob will have this state. If she just takes her vertical and phase shifts it by 180 degrees or it multiplies it by minus one, then when Bob gets her package, it will be this. And if she does both of those two transformations and then sends her particle, then the state Bob ends up with is this. And these four states are all perfectly entangled. They're all mutually orthogonal. So in principle, Bob could measure which entangled state he has now and decode which of these four messages. That's notable for two reasons. It's, it's dense for the reason that a message was transmitted by Alice ultimately sending a single particle, which in and of itself is only a two-state particle. And she can send one of four different messages on this. 
And it's secure because if Eve intercepts, I know it's not Eve. Try Googling for a good picture of Eve. Uh, um, if Eve intercepts Alice's particle, she will learn nothing at all by measuring the state of Alice's particle. Because remember that any measurement on one of the single particles is completely random anyway. So if Alice does these different transformations, she changes one randomness to a different randomness. There's no way that Eve, by measuring only Alice's particle, can tell anything about what Alice meant to say to Bob. So they've achieved their goal of being secure. In, principle, in practice, there are a bunch of different challenges with this um, that I don't have time to get into. But this will give you just a little bit of a flavor of why quantum entanglement of photons might be an interesting thing to do in a quantum communication and cryptography, cryptography scenario, and how simple, in principle, it can look. Okay. I think I'm out of time, so I'll stop there. What is that, I guess, what's the significance of that? What do we... I guess, um, it's, it's right. a big question. <laughs> so, um, so part of the significance of that is, is this is why excited states are not stable forever. And I would say that in many ways, like that's the really big, well, I'm an experimentalist, so in many ways that, that's the really big huge significance of that is this is why things go to their, this is why atoms go to their ground states. Um, otherwise, if you solve the hydrogen atom Hamiltonian and you get the 25th excited state, it's a bound state and it's a, an eigenstate of the Hamiltonian so it should live forever. Um, so this is, the, the existence of spontaneous emission is, I would argue, one of the really hugest consequences of the fact that the ground state of the electromagnetic field um, is not a zero energy state, so it's not a state in which you can count on there being zero electric field everywhere. There will be these fluctuations away from zero. Um, if I were a cosmologist or a field theorist or something like that, I might now try to wax eloquent, eloquent about the zero point energy of all the quantum fields in the universe and how this ought to give us something about the value of the cosmological constant, but I think I better stop. Probably should have stopped like a sentence ago. Because <laughs> it, it doesn't work. <laughs> yeah. Um, look at that. Like, I mean, the concepts and anything else I've seen about it, it looks like the concepts behind like, quantum encryption are basically the same concepts behind like, any encryption. So when people say stuff about it being like fundamentally different, what do they actually mean? So I would argue what's fundamentally different here is that the encryption standards that you rely on now when you do your internet banking or go on eBay or whatever it is, um, they're, they're based on the idea that a certain task is computationally difficult, computationally resource intensive, and in a prohibitive way. So say factoring a large number into its component primes is, is hard to do and so hard to do that we have all agreed to be fairly confident that nobody's going to do it. Um, but, but that's just a, well, it's hard to do. And if somebody could scale up the resources, then, and and we have increased the size of our keys over time because people have scaled up the resources. Um, the kind of security offered by this quantum encryption is really based fundamentally in the end on the laws of quantum mechanics. So if the laws of quantum mechanics are right, if these states are wherever they are, if these entangled states are states such that really there is, a, these states are real and all experiment shows that they, they seem to be, then for instance, in this scheme, Eve's inability to learn anything by intercepting this one particle is not because some task is computationally difficult for her, but because the laws of physics, something very much akin, for instance, to the uncertainty principle, are saying, can't do it. You can't do it. Right. It's not that, well, she doesn't have a fast enough computer or big to pick the lock. It's just the lock is, by the laws of physics, not possible to be picked. Now, there are all kinds of technical details behind that statement to really get yourself into the situation where the laws apply and there are no loopholes. So I don't want to oversell. <laughs> um, I think you might have been next. So you were talking about the two boxes and you said that he was correct in the example that they're both locked. What if he 
stole Bob's box. Oh, yeah, well, if Eve stole Bob's box. Why would um, she still not be able to yeah. decode the message since they're both wrong? Um, okay, no, there's, so there's no particular lock on these. I'm just saying that when Alice sends Bob the message, the message is locked by virtue of the fact that the only thing being sent over the open channel is her photon, her particle. No, if Eve is able to steal Bob's entire toolbox and then convince Alice that she is Bob, the, the game is up. Yeah. <laughs> yes? How is squeezing done? I, I think that it would be great if I or Paul or someone else were to talk with you about that offline because I'm afraid that I don't have a really nice, tidy, short answer there and I'm conscious of the time. Okay. Uh, maybe one more question. How about? Your whole analogy there, is there a reason why there's only four? Because there's several other different things that Alice could do to achieve. Right, so the particles they're dealing with, they're only dealing with the polarizations of photons. And each photon can only have two mutually orthogonal polarizations. And you put them together, and even though you can play interesting games with how you write their states, um, still the space of quantum mechanical states that's available is a two-dimensional times two-dimensional space. So Alice could do a bunch of different things, but Alice can only do four things that would result in four mutually orthogonal output states. And if they're not mutually orthogonal, then there's no, then it's guaranteed that there's no way for Bob to measure and tell the difference between them accurately 100% of the time. If they wanted to have some, some error rate in, their, in Bob's decoding, they could maybe squeeze some more stuff in there. But, but only for if they want for there to be, in principle, a way to perfectly decode all the time. And I'm afraid that it is high time for us to move on. So I'd love to talk about any of this more at a later time. great to be here today. Um, so you've heard a lot of um, great talks about how prevalent optics is in our everyday lives. And I'm going to talk to you guys today about something very, very specific, which is detecting very, very low concentrations of molecules down to the single molecule limit. So this is, uh, I just wanted to start out with a picture that I quite like. So this is a picture of the world at night. Um, it's an electric lighting 
map, and you can see that more light correlates with more prosperity. So you can see that light is important for prosperity on a global scale, and it's also important for single molecule detection. So first of all, you might ask yourself, why is it important to detect single molecules? So it's important for both fundamental and applied studies. So first of all, one important fundamental study is looking at transient states of protein, of protein folding. And you might ask yourself, why is this important? This is important because form dictates function. So if you could understand how a protein folds, you might be able to control how it functions, and this has a lot of implications. There are also scientific problems, um, such as motor protein movement and step size, which can only be looked at at the single molecule level. I don't know if Um, and so when you're thinking about applied studies, um, if you can detect very, very low concentrations of molecules, you can look at very trace detections of things such as tumor-specific antigens. So you can do things like early detection of cancer, low concentrations of biomarkers for cancer and Alzheimer's. So if you had a way to detect very, very low concentrations of these biomarkers, you might be able to detect cancer before symptoms appear, before a tumor is large enough to be seen on a PET or an X-ray. And you know, such technology would have large societal benefit. And there's also things such as public health detection of bacteria and viruses. So single molecule approaches are useful because you can directly measure molecular properties versus having to take a bulk measurement, a bulk method, and infer, infer how your molecule behaves via model. Um, you don't have to um, synchronize millions of molecules and switch them from one state to the other and say, this is the behavior of a million molecules. What is the behavior of one molecule? And of course, if you can detect very, very low concentrations of molecule, you can vastly reduce the analyte that's required. So if you have sample that's precious or hard to get, or for example, if you want to use this for medical diagnostics and you don't want to take volumes and volumes of blood, then this is a very good technique. And of course, if you can reduce the amount of analytes that, that's required, you can, of course, reduce the amount of money cost, which is an important issue. And so one main advantage of our technology is that it's label-free. And so why is a label-free approach important? So just to briefly review, labels are tags um, that make the molecules easier to detect. Examples are fluorescent markers, radioactive tags, enzymatic labels, quantum dots. But they're expensive. They can be difficult to generate. Um, you can't always get them when you want them, where you want them. They're disruptive. They can perturb events. They can bleach. They can blink. Here's a picture of GFP, green fluorescent protein, probably the most famous example of a fluorescent tag. Right next to it is interleukin-2, which is um, a signaling molecule involved in cancer. And you can see that they're roughly the same order of magnitude in terms of size. And so you can imagine that if you were to bind GFP to IL-2, that this could really perturb studies that you're interested in. And they're complicated. You know, studies often involve multiple tags. And so our technology, which is based on an optical resonator known as a microtoroid, can eliminate the lead for labels. So what's currently available? So the current gold standard for label-free biomolecular interaction is what is known as the Biocore surface plasmid resonance. So Biocore is a company that was sold to General Electric in 2006 for $390 million. And it works on the principle of surface plasmid resonance. You can see here you have a gold sensor chip. Light reflects off the back of this sensor chip via total and total reflection. There's generally a prism put here to create this. It generates an evanescent wavefront similar to what you get in turf microscopy. When molecules bind to the sensor chip, it changes the angle of minimum reflected intensity which reaches your sensor. This is known as your resonance angle. And this is because at that angle, some of the light couples into the gold chip. If um, people remember from Ewan McLeod's talk yesterday, he briefly introduced um, this technology. And so the Biocore actually has a lower limit of detection in the order of nanomolar. This is an experiment I did in which I bound strabdavidin, which is a protein, to the surface of this gold center chip. And I started out at 360 nanomolars of biotinylated protein G. This is a protein that has a biotin molecule conjugated to it, that, which is going to bind to this rhabdavidin. And I did a half-log dilution series all the way down to atomolars. And you can see this bottom trace is 3.16 nanomolar, and it actually represents eight traces from nanomolars all the way down to atomolars, which the Biocore simply cannot distinguish because it doesn't have the capability to, to go down that low. And you can see that for a variety of applications, you might be interested in concentrations that are below nanomolars. So our design goals, we wanted something that was very, very sensitive and very, very fast. Um, the technologies represented up here are other biomolecular or ways to sense biomolecules, other technologies. This is the surface plasma resonance. This is what I was just talking about. This is a suspended microchannel resonator. So this is, you basically have a beam. It's bound on both ends. And when molecules bind to the beam, it changes the frequency at which this beam resonates. Um, these are nanowires. I'm sure you guys have heard of this. Uh, lateral flow assay, commonly known as a pregnancy test. 
These are microring resonators. This is another kind of optical resonator, which I'll discuss later in my talk. Um, this is a quartz crystal microbalance. This is a biobarcode assay. This is immunofluorescence assay, in which you're looking at fluorescence from antibodies. Um, and this is, these are microcantilevers. So you have a cantilever, also particles bind. This changes the frequency at which these cantilevers resonate. And you can typically see, and this dotted line represents the present state of the art, and you can typically see that if you want technology that's very, very sensitive, often it has a long detection time. It takes you a long time to get your result. And so the technology that we've developed is something that's very, very sensitive down to the single molecule limit, and it's very, very fast. You can get results in under 30 seconds. So how do we achieve our goal? So optical resonators, they belong, they're also known as whispering gallery mode resonators, and they're so named after the acoustic whispering gallery mode. Uh, or the acoustic whispering gallery, which is an architectural feature. And it was first described by Lord Rayleigh in 1910. What he did was he stood under the dome of St. Paul's Cathedral in London, and he noticed that whispers at one end of the dome could be heard 40 meters away at the other end of the dome because sound would skirt along the edges of the dome with negligible loss. There are examples of this all over the world. This is the Hagia Sophia in Istanbul. There's the Temple of Heaven in Beijing. There is one in the Grand Central Station in New York. Um, and our technology, the microtoroid, is the optical analog of this. So instead of sound going around architectural feature, we have light circulating inside a glass device over and over again. Okay, so there are many, many different examples of whispering gallery mode resonators. They are different shapes. These are the most commonly examples used in biological sensing. So this is a microsphere. So this is formed by melting the end of an optical fiber so that you form a very, very surface tension causes a very, very smooth sphere to develop. Um, this has been doped with the rare earth element orbidium so that you can see light orbiting within the sphere. And this constant circulation of light inside these devices is what gives a, the light a very, very long path length, and which is key for the sensitivity of, the, of these devices. And light is coupled into these devices using a waveguide or an optical fiber. So you see here is the sphere. Um, what you can't see behind it is that there is an optical fiber that's evanescently coupling light into it. This is a simulation of a microring. The red arrow indicates the direction of the light. So you, this is a waveguide light is being evanescently coupled. The bright colors represent the electric field inside the, these devices. And how you monitor what the resonance frequency of the device is, is you put a photo detector at the end of this waveguide or optical fiber. And you can see when light enters, um, at the resonance frequency, it enters this device, and you get constructive amplification of light inside the device. And when it exits, um, it undergoes a phase shift because it has gone through a round trip inside the device. It comes out, it destructively interferes with the light going through the waveguide or optical fiber. This drop in intensity is how we monitor what the resonance frequency of these cavities are. And when molecules bind, it changes the frequency at which these devices resonate. And so this dip in the intensity is how we use to mo what we use to monitor molecular binding events. Okay. So this is the technology that we use. It's called the microtroid. It's essentially a ring on, the pe on a pedestal. So what it is is it's lifted off the substrate um, via this pedestal, and this enables less light scattering because light is not being scattered off the surface of the substrate, and also when molecules are trying to bind, it doesn't have to deal with interaction off the substrate, and so this enables us to have very, very highly sensitive detection. Okay. And so as another way to understand what gives our devices high sensitivity, you can think of a spectrometer. So you have light, um, you have a sample solution, so you have molecules in a solution, and when light is shone, it's shone through, it's sort of attenuated, sort of absorbed by your um, cuvette or whatever's in your cuvette, and you can measure this with like a meter. And you can relate your absorbance that you measure with a concentration by the Beer-Lambert law. And what you can see is that, you know, if you want to measure very, very low concentrations, one way to do this is to have a very, very long path length. That is, if you want to keep um, your measurement above a certain signal-to-noise ratio. And so this is how our devices work. We have this constant circulation of light inside our devices. We have a very, very long path length. So here is, um, you're going to see a simulation. This is a micro ring with two wave guides on either side. And you're going to see light launched in through the bottom right-hand corner of this. And you're going to see light amplification within the cavity and you're going to due to constructive interference. And then you're going to see destructive interference at the end of the wave guide. So at the end of the wave guide, this is where we would put our detector. And this is how we can monitor what the frequency of these devices are. And this actually happens because the diameter of this ring is equal to an integer number times the wavelength of the input light going through your waveguide. And this is known as the resonance frequency. So you can see an intensity drop because light is going through your resonator and also an intensity drop because of destructive interference. You see the second path, you can see the light getting brighter within your device. And this drop in intensity is how we monitor the, the frequency of this cavity. 
So this is just a picture of a scanning electron micrograph of our resonator to toroid. They're about 80 to 90 microns in diameter. Um, this is a cross-section. It has a dumbbell cross-section. And so what happens is that light, we evanescently couple light in using an optical fiber. Light continuously, totally internally reflects around the rim of this device. It, due to the bent, uh, the curved interface, this generates an evanescent wavefront, similar to what you get, as I said before, in turf microscopy. Molecules bind. This causes slight changes in the index of a fraction of your device, which causes the resonance frequency to shift. And this is how we detect molecular binding events. So just to give you some numbers, our devices have a photon lifetime of 270 nanoseconds. And this time light goes around our device 270,000 times, or 68 meters. So it's like a cuvette that's 68 meters long, and it could fit inside your pocket. It's very, very small. It's about 100 microns in diameter. And so we have very, very high sensitivity. And so th why does the wavelength shift? The theory for this has been around for a very, very long time since 1945, it's, there's a field known as cavity perturbation theory, which tells us how the resonance frequency of these devices shift when a particle binds and perturbs the cavity. And it's basically the polarization of the particle. So when a particle enters the evanescent field, it's polarized by your cavity. Cavity expends energy to polarize the particle. This causes a drop in your resonance frequency. This is something that was never really tested before at the molecular level because your signals were masked by noise. And so, what makes these particles very, very difficult to detect? Well, one is that your signal strength scales as R cubed. That means it scales as your particle volume, which means it's eight times as difficult to detect something that's half as small. So to detect a 2.5 nanometer radius particle, which is on the order of a single molecule, you would need to resolve a wavelength shift that's less than 0 0.006 femtometers. So that's one part in 10 to the 12. So to give you some comparison, for those of you who are wearing watches, some of you guys might have a quartz crystal inside your watch. So those are accurate to about one part in 10 to the 6. So that's one second in a month. So this would be one second in a million months or one second in 100,000 years. And as a point of comparison, a Rolex, which is advertised as the best mechanical movements ever, has an accuracy of one part in 10 to the fifth, but at great expense, you'd pay like around thousands of dollars, like $8,000 for a Rolex. Um, so in terms of optical frequencies, atomic clocks have been shown to be accurate to one part in 10 to the 14th. Um, in a commercial setting and in a research setting recently, one part in 10 to the 18. So this is something that should be possible, even in sort of a complicated environment where you're sensing biological molecules. So there are some recent advances. So microrings, which I showed you earlier and which you saw the simulation of, they're able to detect picomolar detection, picomolar concentrations of molecules. So this is an example of detection. So this is your resonance wavelength and how it changes over time as molecules bind. So it was, it's able to detect picomolar concentrations of interleukin-2. Um, this is the ca cancer signaling molecule that you saw earlier. Um, optofluidic ring resonators, these are glass capillaries in which you flow your analyte through the capillary and you excite resonances in the glass around, um, around which things are being flowed. This is also capable of picomolar detection of breast cancer signaling molecules, HER2. Um, microspheres have been shown to be capable of single virus detection. So the way you interpret this is your, ring, your sphere is resonating at one particular frequency. A single virus binds, it resonates to another frequency. Another virus binds, frequency shifts again. Um, but you still need to go down another 6,000 in terms of mass to be able to detect a single protein. Uh, so about five years ago, six years ago, the microtroid was shown to be capable of detecting 25 nanometer polystyrene uh, beads, but you still need to go down another factor of 100 in terms of mass to detect a single protein molecule. Very recently, people have been using um, plasmonically enhanced devices. So they, are, they take gold nanoshells, gold nanorods, they put them on the surface of these devices, and through this, they're able to detect single protein molecules such as um, BSA and other smaller proteins. However, the disadvantage of that is that you have a very, very small capture area. So you have two hot spots per particle. Um, these nanoshells are rather small. And so the ideal thing would be to take the thin ribbon of light associated with a bare cavity, which has no plasmonic enhancement, because you have thousands of times more capture area. So you are more likely to see detection events. OK. So this slide basically describes how our devices are fabricated. So basically, you have a silicon wafer. You have a 2 micron thick layer of silicon dioxide. These are commercially available wafers. And what we do is we pattern circular pads of photoresist. This, the photoresist protects the glass, the SiO2. Um, and what happens is you do a hydrofluoric acid etch, which etches the, away the areas that are not protected by the photoresist. And then you rinse that off. And then what you do is a xenon difluoride etch, which is a selective silicon etchant. So you undercut your glass, and you form these pillars. And you get these little mushroom-shaped devices. And at this stage, this resonator is what is known as a microdisc. And how you make this into a microtroid is you use a CO2 laser, which uh, the wavelength is 10.6 microns, which is heat. You basically irradiate your microdisc. 
um, you heat up the glass, it collapses, and it forms these dumbbell-shaped cross sections, and this is known as a microtoroid. And the heat causes a very, very, very smooth surface finish. It's actually atomically smooth, and this allows us to maintain light in these devices for such a long period of time in the order of nanoseconds. And another interesting thing about the toroid is it allows for um, wafer-based fabrication. So ideally, this allows for the potential of multiplexing, which means that you can do multiple experiments in parallel. So you can imagine that if you were to use these devices for medical diagnostics, you would have an array of these devices. Each device would be functionalized with a different capture agent for a different biomarker that you're looking for. Right? So you could do like uh, disease diagnostics of a variety of different diseases, like, you know, do I have Ebola, do I have Zika, et cetera. And very, very quickly. And so this is an SEM of, these, of an array of these devices. They're about 100 microns in diameter. They're about spaced around 400 microns apart. And here is a, a video I have. So this is a, a top view. So this white circle that you see is a pillar. Um, you're looking from the top. This is your SiO2. This is your glass. So this is what it's known as in the micro disk state. And what you're going to see is the CO2 laser hit it. It's irradiated normally here. And it's going to collapse and form the toroid. So, and where it flashes bright white is where it gets very, very hot. And you can see here, this is, um, this beaded area at the end is uh, where light circulates around. So you can see this is, the final, and so light goes, will go around and around the rim here. This is your silicon pillar that you're looking at from the top, so light is being reflected back, which is why it appears white. And so this is our experimental setup. This is a rendering I did. This shows a top view once more of your toroid. Light is coupled in evanescently using an optical fiber. This is um, in vitro, which means that our sensors are on an optical table. They're not inside your body. They're basically on a sample stage. And a microscope slide is cantilevered out over the top. We have a syringe pump, and we flow solutions containing our analysts of interest, uh, you know, cancer biomarkers, whatever we want to detect over our our um, sensor. And the way we actually measure this is, so the way people typically measure um, or do these experiments is they constantly scan to look for what is the resonance frequency of these devices. So they're constantly scanning to say, to locate resonance. When things bind, then they're constantly rescanning and scanning just to locate, you know, what is the frequency of our, of our device. And what we do is we do active tracking of the resonance, which is we lock our laser to our cavity. When molecules bind and shift our cavity off resonance, we measure the amount of voltage our laser controller has to apply to stay on resonance. And then we convert that voltage to a wavelength so we know how, how much our resonance wavelength has shifted. And this is how we measure binding events. Okay, so this is a technique we call this flower. So it's basically a laser-locked microcavity with an auto-balanced photoreceiver. So basically we have a laser, we have a 50-50 beam splitter. We send half the light through the toroid, half to an auto-balanced photoreceiver, which basically subtracts out the signal contribution simply due to laser intensity fluctuations. Um, this signal is multiplied by a dither signal, so your laser frequency is dithered in a very, very small region around where your resonance frequency is, so we know, are you on resonance, are you off resonance? And based on that, it generates an error signal, which is fed into a proportional integral derivative controller, such that you can reach the set point that you want, your desired set point, as quickly as possible. And this is fed back into our laser controller. And this has several advantages. One, you're, consistently sta you're continuously staying on resonance in instead of sweeping past resonance. And this enables us to sample more points per second, which enables more averaging. So this is an example of some raw data we have. These are um, exosomes. So exosomes are about 30 to 90 nanometers in diameter. They're basically shed by all cells, but they're recently attracted particular interest because when they are shed by tumor cells, they have tumor-specific antigens on them. And so they can be used as biomarkers for cancer. And the idea would be that... Um, they're shed into your bloodstream, and so you could just take a drop of blood, so you're exploiting the circulation of your blood, and you won't actually have to find or access tumors, so you don't have to uh, have surgery. This is known as a liquid biopsy, and it has uh, tremendous advantages for people who, you know, obviously don't want to go under anesthesia and have surgery. And so uh, what you're seeing here is you're seeing, so this voltage is later converted to a wavelength. You're seeing, so your toroid is at one frequency, when a single exosome binds, it shifts to a different frequency. Another exosome binds, it shifts to a different frequency. So these are, represent single binding events. And these burst-like events are what we interpret as um, exosomes trying to bind onto toward incomplete binding events. And so this is just all the filtering that we do. So we remove known signal sources of noise, like 60 hertz, or the dither signal that we apply is 2 kilohertz, et cetera. Um, okay, so these are just some experimental results. Um, this is a signal from 10 nanometer radius beads. This is already better than what anyone has done before. These are polystyrene beads. So once again, you're at one frequency. 
a bead binds, it shifts to a different frequency. And so these, in this case, these are polystyrene beads, and they're simply binding by the Van der Waals interaction of these particles landing on your resonator. And what happens is that we can get a histogram of these binding events, and a histogram occurs, you get a variation in size for two main reasons. One is that when you buy these beads, they have a certain size variation. You have a certain size distribution. So this in, in itself leads to a histogram of binding sizes. The second is that the, this is a simulation, so once more this is a dumbbell cross-section, is that your intensity of light within the device, um, it's greatest at the center and sort of falls off on the sides. So you, the signal that you see, the resonance wavelength shift that you see is proportional to the intensity of light within your cavity. So when particles bind here at the center, you will see your cavity will undergo a larger resonance shift than when particles bind on the side. And this is also what generates the, um, this histogram. And so what we do when we do comparison with theory is we just look at the largest wavelength shift because you can never get a value larger than what lands at the equator. And this is what we use to make our theoretical um, comparisons. And so we actually get fairly good uh, theoretical agreement. Um, this is an example of a ribosome. So once more, you know, we see this, these sort of steps corresponding to the binding of individual ribosomes. And if you look at the, the dwell times, the time in between each step, it follows a exponential distribution, which is what we would expect for independent events arriving in time. And this is um, very small. This is human interlaken 2. So this is about a radius of 2 nanometers or about 4 nanometers for the whole um, protein. And when you zoom in, you can see these very, very tiny, tiny steps, which the height of which corresponds with what we would expect from theory. And we've also done experiments where we vary the concentration. We can see that the number of these steps scale with concentration, whatnot, which is what you would expect if these steps were due to the binding of individual particles. And so this is uh, just a graph showing our theoretical and experimental agreement. The different colored solid lines represent the different dielectric constants of our particles. So you see the black represents polystyrene, the blue represents silica, um, the green for proteins. Our dielectric factor is given here. It's basically a difference between the index of refraction of our particle and the index of refraction of the surrounding media, like whatever it's in, like saline solution, et cetera. And so it's also interesting to note that this, well, okay, let's see. So our results agree very well for very sleek sized particles. So this was one of the first examples that I did was, um, this was our first sort of medical application, which is we took mice, we implanted them with human tumors. Um, these were lymphoma tumors, and we looked at um, exosomes in the blood. So we took one microliter of blood and we f diluted it a million times in saline and we floated over the surface of our resonator. So basically, as I explained before, um, tumors secrete exosomes, or all cells secrete exosomes, but exosomes in particular have tumor-specific antigens when they're secreted by tumors. And if we can quantify the amount of the concentration of exosomes, we can determine, is a tumor present? How far has a tumor um, grown or progressed without actually having to find our access to tumor? So what we did was every week we let the uh, tumor grow. So we chose a very, very aggressive tumor so it would grow very, very fast. And every week we uh, took samples, then we froze down all the samples, and then we flowed them all over our resonator sequentially. As you can see, at week zero, we saw very little response from our sensor. And then as weeks increased, we saw larger signal shifts, presumably from larger concentrations of exosomes binding to the surface of our toroid. In this case, our resonator was functionalized specifically for um, these exosomes. So they had a, a specific antibody, that w what we were looking for. Okay, and then as a control, of course, we had a mouse with no tumor. We looked at, you know, week zero or week one or week five, and we saw no um, increase is what we would expect. Okay, so this was just an example. If you zoom into one of the weeks, um, you can see these individual step-like events, and these steps, the height of these steps correspond to what we would expect for exosomes. And we also did an independent measurement with a different technique, um, which we got the, the same size. Um, the particles. Okay, so where do we go from here? So one, we're very interested in improving the selectivity of these devices. So particularly, we're interested in using these for medical diagnostics. So we don't want any false positives. More importantly, we don't want false negatives of people if we're going to be diagnosing them with diseases. Um, we're looking at early detection of Alzheimer's. So we're looking at um, a blood-based Alzheimer's assay. So um, 
right now, Alzheimer's people diagnosed using uh, cerebral spinal fluid, which is a highly invasive procedure, which involves a spinal tap. We're looking at protein fragments, which may leak through the blood-brain barrier. Um, so this enables us to look at um, whether someone has Alzheimer's, also uh, progression and um, intervention methods, such like, for example, if someone exercises, what is the effect on these different concentrations within your um, blood? So this has advantages because if people have a biopsy, they don't obviously, they don't want to do subsequent biopsies for, you know, for other treatment measures. So this is a good way to do things. And um, we're looking at early detection of cancer, so uh, cancer biomarkers. So very, very low concentrations of cancer biomarkers. Um, we recently got a grant looking at performance enhancing drug detection. So basically athletes engage in a practice known as microdosing, which is they know what is the lowest detectable limit of these sensors, and they're dosing right below that limit. And so it becomes a game of how sensitive you can make these sensors. And with you know, events such as the Olympics and stuff, there's a lot of national pride and money. There's a large amount of money being pumped into this. And so um, something we're also looking at water safety, bacteria, algal blooms in water, food safety, ammonia from spoiled meat and whatnot. Um, environmental monitoring, we're interested in miniaturizing these sensors, putting them in, on drones for environmental monitoring, looking at chemical warfare agents, um, industrial toxins, um, of course, understanding basic biological functions, and um, portable diagnostics. So right now, this is on a, an optical table that's three by five, and we're interested in shrinking this system and making it the size of a cell phone such that we can give it to an EMT in an ambulance, a soldier on a battlefield, and um, stuff like that. So. We go from here. So just in conclusion, we really improve the signal to noise of these ratios such that ratio of these devices such that a single molecule can be detected from background. We just demonstrated detection over a large range of particle sizes and different materials. We demonstrated detection of ribosomes, exosomes, creating a non-invasive tumor biopsy system. And we looked at single molecules. So I'd just like to thank the following people, and I'm happy to answer any questions. So concentration is related to the total resonance shift? Yes, yes, exactly. How do you target certain molecules? Uh, so different ways. So in, th in this case, um, for the exosomes, we're using antibodies. So we selectively pick capture agents for what we're interested in detecting. So antibodies, but you know, it could be, we could also use DNA strands, aptamers, variety of other ways. So the, the surface is glass, so it's easy to functionalize with um, standard methods that people use for functionalizing glass surfaces. So uh, just about how do you get from, um, from molecules attaching to the beat to the concentration? Is it the rate by, uh, by which they are attaching? Or particularly when you have very small concentrations and only can get you know, 10 molecules, like how, do, how, do you, how do you get the concentration information from that binding? Yeah, yeah, so exactly. So right now what we do is um, when we flow in like pure solutions, so we know a priori what the um, what the concentration is, is that we're flowing in. Um, eventually, when you're getting down to single molecule level, you can count. You can do counting of like the molecules, and you might have to actually do some modeling of the of the fluid flow around your resonator to get some idea of the concentration. But the way you do it is you make a calibration curve. So you flow in known solutions, you see what your resonance shift is, and then eventually you build up a calibration curve, and then, then you put in an unknown concentration, and you see where does this shift lie on my calibration curve. So you don't have to theoretically figure out the No, it actually probably is actually the easiest thing to do is just to experimentally make a calibration curve. Yeah. 